Um, <laughs> good morning. My name is Kathy Arocco, and we are so glad that you are joining us today for worship. Each week, we gather uh, for the curious and the committed around the person and work of Jesus Christ, because we believe that he is our only hope for today. He is our true wisdom, and he invites each of us to come to him and worship. And we hear this invitation from Psalm 67. It says this, may God be gracious to us and bless us. May he make his face shine upon us so that your way may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, God. Let all the peoples praise you. All right, well, good morning again, everyone. Let's stand together to sing to our God. We're reminded that he's the one who made us, that we are his people. He called us out of darkness and into light. So we rejoice in that. Let's sing together. How great is our God. 
sing it out. Sing with me. take to pause, reflect, to confess the things that God brings to mind. Um, I think that statement is such a good, helpful thing for us. Your love is greater. Your love is stronger. Um, maybe that's something that we can pray that God will, will draw to our minds whenever we're tempted this week. That no matter what we are tempted to trust in, He is greater. He is stronger. He is more sure than that thing that we think will hold us, that that thing that we think will save us or make us complete. Um, so we're going to take a moment and ask for his help to believe that, to see that once again, to confess the ways we've done wrong, to confess the ways that we failed to trust, and ask for his help. Now let's do that together now. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes.
Father, we were tempted to trust in such flimsy things. They, they seem more beautiful, more strong than you are in the moment. But we know that nothing can compare to your power, to your goodness. So we pray that you will help tear our hearts from the things that draw us away from you. Help us to see you as truly good. Help us not to rely on our own strength, but to rely on Christ in us, the hope of glory. We thank you for the forgiveness that we have in him alone. It's in Jesus' name we pray.
out together.
love to sing that one more time. Um, thinking ahead to this week that we're about to enter into, thinking about the struggles that we'll face, um, the temptations that we'll face. And let's, let's make this a prayer that this will be true, that we'll fight on our knees, that we will lift up the name of Jesus, and cry out to him in no other name. Let's lift this up together. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. Battle belongs to you. Father, that's true. Whether we realize it or not in the moment, you are the one safe place that we have. You are the one sure foundation for our whole lives. God, we thank you for giving us your word to explain who you are to show us what truth and goodness and beauty is. We thank you for making it alive for us by your spirit. We thank you that you've promised that you are meeting with us even now. Help us to be aware of you at work in our lives and those around us. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. And take a seat. Hello. Yes. Thank you, worship team, again, for leading us uh, into the presence of the Lord and worshiping. Well, good morning. My name is Kathy Arocco, and if you are new here today, we are glad that you are visiting with us. If you've been here for a while, we're also glad that you are with us. In the summertime, it kind of ebbs and flows with people, so it's just great to be together uh, worshiping the Lord today. If you are new, if you could grab the blue Connect card on the bench in front of you and fill that out, that would be awesome. Uh, you can turn that in in the boxes in the back. You can give it to someone who's wearing a name tag and make sure you pick up the green Grace Bible Church mug in the back as a thank you. But what this does is it allows our welcome team to follow up with you to make sure all your questions about uh, church here is, are answered and connect you in any way that you want to be connected. Here at Grace Bible Church, there are three ways that we seek to follow Jesus together as a community. Uh, first is gather and worship, like we are doing right now. Uh, it's a great way to hear the word preached and to sing praise and worship together. And we meet at different times, and there's also the online time. If you're out of town, you can jump online and watch the service there. Next is serve on a team. This is a great way for you to serve alongside other believers. It's kind of like a family, and we're doing serving together to make body life work here at Grace Bible Church. And there's different teams that you can be a part of to make all of this happen, and it's a great way to make relationships and to grow in your faith and just serve other people. Uh, and the third way is to join a group, and there's sign-ups. I'll talk about that later, but we're starting some new groups that will be um, starting up. There's also groups that are happening. Uh, women's ministry has been going on. But, again, this is a way for you to enrich your faith, enrich your relationships by gathering around the precious word of God and praying together and uh, just encouraging one another in your walk. So if you have questions about any of those three steps, you can contact the office at Be Grace, and they will get you pointed in the direction uh, that's most helpful for you. Coming up in July, because we are almost in July, July 9th, there will be a blood drive here at Grace Bible Church. Now, Intel has told me that the summer is the lowest amount of donations, so they need blood. Um, so it's a great way for you to serve the community, literally giving of yourself. Um, and you can just show up, or you can go online at begrace.org backslash backslash blood and sign in for a, an appointment time, really, so that when you show up, they will take your arm. Um, so you can contact Joey if you have any questions about that, but that's coming up in a couple weeks, so eat your hearty breakfast and be here. 
And also coming up is Christmas in July. So July happens next Sunday. We will have a Christmas tree in the lobby. And this is for Foster Love Bell County, which is a local ministry to kids who are in the foster system. And so this is a fundraiser. So you can take an ornament that's on a tree and donate to whatever that ornament is tells you about. Or you can go online and donate directly there at fosterlovebellcounty.org. Uh, a, a great way to be a part of this life-affirming ministry and taking care of kids who are in the foster care system in our county. If you have questions about that, you can also email the office at Be Grace for that as well. And then coming up right after the service, we are having our small groups sign up. We had those last week. They're out in the lobby. You can, there's clipboards out there. You can meet people who are leading the small groups, ask any questions, uh, take a look and see what's um, being offered that meets your needs. Again, the, that's kind of how our church organizes its community life. It's through small groups. So please pray and consider about being involved in that. All right, so I'm going to turn this mic over to Chris because he has a special introduction. Thanks, Kathy. Um, well, Dave is out for, for this week, but we have a special guest a preacher. One of our elders, Jonathan Cobb, is going to be sharing God's word with us. So I'm excited. Yeah, you can come up. Jonathan and his wife, Kaylin, we've gotten to know over the years. I didn't, like, prepare an official, official uh, Good. bio. I told him I was going to make up things about him, um, but I didn't even make up anything interesting. Uh, <laughs> Dave always says you're a shepherd, which is true. Is that how you describe yourself? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So he's actually a real shepherd out, out near Rogers, and yeah. we've been out to their, their farm. I think the, the way he's blessed me the most is his love of, of art and talking about philosophy together and theology, and uh, we got to go out and do some, some music time and songwriting out at the farm. That was super cool. Um, so hope to do that again, but I've just been blessed by his encouragement as a brother and um, yeah, I just wanted to pray for you before you preach, if that's yeah, okay. Sure. Um, so us shy people got to stick together. Yes. So. All right. We're a matchy, matchy. <laughs> yeah, we match pretty good. <laughs> that's good. All right. God, I thank you so much for Jonathan and Kaylin. Um, thank you for this chance to open your word. I pray that um, Jonathan will just rest in that truth, that the power belongs to you, that, that you have promised to use your word to good effect in our lives. And so I pray that you'll just help him to speak clearly and think clearly and just deliver what you've laid on his heart by your word and through your spirit. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, brother. All right. Welcome. I want to thank you all for being here this morning, and I want to acknowledge really quickly that we all come uh, to services in different places. So I know that each of you are mentally in different places. Some of you are celebrating today. Some of you are struggling today. Some of you are mourning today and grieving. So it, it creates this kind of strange dichotomy, I think. Uh, op oftentimes kind of wonder about that whenever I'm sitting out here, like, you know, some of us are just really happy and some of us are really struggling to find hope. And so I just want to acknowledge that, um, that we're all here in different places. Um, but we believe that God calls us here uh, each Sunday to show us his grace and his love. And um, if you're struggling uh, right now to believe that fully, I want you to know you're not alone. Um, we come and we believe that God is perfect, and it's not the measure of our faith, it's the object of our faith that saves us, and he is perfect and he's faithful. So I want to encourage you in that. Last week, Dave kicked off our uh, summer sermon series that we're doing in Proverbs. And if you were here, you might remember uh, that he talked about wisdom being scandalous, and that's kind of the theme of the series is that God's wisdom is scandalous. It's scandalous to our very nature uh, because we don't want to trust God. Uh, we've been, uh, since the fall, uh, not trusting God completely and struggling with that. And so verse 7 last week, uh, 1 verse 7, was uh, kind of the main emphasis, and that's that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, and fools despise wisdom and instruction. And so I want to pick up kind of on that theme, I came across a uh, illustration reading an article last week, um, and it was uh, it goes like this. So imagine a sailor, and he's new to a ship, and he's confused as to where the ship is heading. It's nighttime, and the ship's mo movements don't square up with the training that he has to use the North Star 
as a guiding point. So confused, he goes to the captain and he says, Captain, where are we going? And the captain says, we do things a little differently on this ship. See that lantern up on the bow? That's our guiding light. That's how we're making our way across the sea. Guiding a ship by a reference point that's on the ship means that ship is adrift, voyaging to nowhere. And this can create anxiety among the crew, obviously. So the point there is we need a greater reference point that's outside of ourselves and outside of our world. And this is why we study the scriptures each week. This is why we seek to be guided by, by God and our wisdom. So today's sermon I'm calling Enticing Hope. So most of uh, your Bibles will have a, a heading for this section called The Enticement of Sinners. And enticement is a verb that means to attract artfully by arousing hope or desire to tempt. But I want to go, before we go to dig into Proverbs, I want to go back to the beginning. And I want to read really quickly from, uh, from Genesis uh, chapter 3. And um, just read a little bit here. So if you remember, Satan's come to Eve and he's tempting her. And he said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of, the, of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves loincloths. So as we see very, very early on in the beginning, we were tempted, we were allured, we um, were attracted artfully to arouse hope in being like God and having knowledge like him. So that's nothing new. Uh, it's eternal. And these types of things are what gives me assurance whenever I'm tempted by the voices out there, especially in our modern world, to say, oh, the Bible is just a really ancient uh, book. It might have had wisdom for ancient people back then, but it has no relevance to the modern world and modern life. Um, this stuff gives me assurance because we haven't figured it out. We're just the same as we ever were. Um, and so this scandalous Bible... Uh, that we learned about last week. Um, let's see what it has for us today. So if you will, if you have a Bible, turn with me to Proverbs. Chapter 1 will be in verse 8 through 19 today. If you don't have a Bible, there's one, there should be a black Bible in the underneath of the seat in front of you, and it'll be page 527 in that Bible page 527. And if you don't have a Bible for yourself, please take that. We want you to have it. We really do. So please take it with you. Let me turn there. It happens to be page 527 in my Bible. All right. We're going to read this together. Hear, my son, your father's instruction. And forsake not your mother's teaching, for they are a graceful garland for your head and pendants for your neck. My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. If they say, come with us, let us lie in wait for blood. Let us ambush the innocent without reason. Like Sheol, let us swallow them alive and whole like those who go down to the pit. We shall find all precious goods. We shall fill our houses with plunder. Throw in your lot among us. We will have one purse. 
My son, do not walk in the way with them. Hold back your foot from their paths, for their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed blood. For in vain is a net spread in the sight of any bird. But these men lie in wait for their own blood. They set an ambush for their own lives. Such are the ways of everyone who is greedy for unjust gain. It takes away the life of its Excuse me, possessors. Um, so we believe that God's word is supernatural. We believe that he speaks to us um, with authority through that and that we need his Holy Spirit to help us to receive that and to understand it. And so I want to pray with, uh, for us that God would be with us. So we pray with me. Father, thank you so much for your grace towards us that you do not leave us alone adrift uh, in an ocean with only ourselves uh, to guide us. We would never make it to the shore. So thank you for providing wisdom, giving it to us in your grace. And um, we just ask, Holy Spirit, that you would be here with us, be in this place, protect our minds from any distractions that would come in and rush in and try to tease us away from what you're trying to tell us pray for um, your message to be clearly given and clearly received. We pray for your spirit to be with us. In Christ we pray. Amen. All right. So most of the text that we'll be talking about is being enticed or attracted to false hopes. Um, but it starts off... Uh, here in verses 8 and 9, um, with the father calling out to his son and, and saying, you know, hear me, uh, listen to this, it's going to be good. Um, he says, hear my son your father's instruction and forsake not your mother's teaching, for they are a graceful garland for your head and pendants for your neck. I think as modern people we can kind of read the text really quickly a lot of times, and so I kind of just want to slow it down for us and realize that this is God's compassion as a father saying, listen, listen, I want your life to be better. Um, so the Proverbs, I think Dave kind of touched on that last week, proverbial wisdom, these Proverbs are instructions, and they weren't uncommon in the ancient world. Um, you might say common sense in a lot of ways, and so we can gather um, instructions in this. This is actually the first book of the Bible that I read straight through, uh, I think I was between eighth grade and, and freshman year of high school, but back then I, I was studying, I think, more to be religious than I was to understand Jesus, and so I was looking for practical things that I could do to be a, a good kid uh, or to be wise, and so this proverbial wisdom, while it, it can make our lives easier, um, People who live wisely tend to be winsome people. Those are the types of people you want on your team. People who show up on time, people who are honest, uh, people who work hard. Um, so it can lead to good things in life, but ultimately it's not the main premise of this, uh, of this story and what God's calling us to, wisdom, the fear of the Lord. Um, it's a way that co God actually gives common grace to our world, I believe, through proverbial wisdoms that are, are true throughout time and history. And so these garlands, these pendants, uh, in this context would have been seen kind of like a, a prince, um, or you might think of a gold medalist winning an award. It's a, a place of honor. It's, it's like, wow, that person has done well in their life, and they're receiving this honor. And so he's saying, this wisdom will make you esteemed and attractive to the world. But then he jumps into these warnings. Um, so when, <laughs> when Dave asked me to preach this, he was like, it's a warning text, so it's going to be a little, a little different. Uh, I was like, great, thanks. But uh, <laughs> Joey, does Dave have a habit of leaving town whenever there's a hard text? Or? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> no, just kidding. It's, it is interesting, though, and I, I wondered... Um, the whole time I'm studying it, going, why did he put this right here? So he starts off, you know, like, 
wisdom. It's, it's an introduction to Proverbs. So the first nine chapters will really be, this was a micro introduction, and then we're moving into these kind of bigger poems about wisdom and the importance of wisdom and introducing us to that. But why did he start with a story about robbers on the side of the road? Um, why is this at the front, front-loaded um, before all the other uh, warnings that we'll get? And I, I scratched my head about it a bunch, and I, I don't know exactly why, but I think it's, it's universal in all of us. Um, and I hope, hope we can kind of flesh that out and see that. Um, so the first kind of point um, that I want to make is the enticement, the enticing hope of strength. And so what they're calling out here in verses 10 through 13 are, he's, he's warning against, is, my son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. If they say, come with us, let us lie and wait for blood. Let us ambush the innocent without reason. Like Sheol, let us swallow them alive and whole. Like those who go down to the pit, we shall find all precious goods. We shall fill our houses with plunder. So this enticement comes from when we see our own, our own selves as wise, we drift away from God's wisdom. We start to rely on our own strength, our own wisdoms. And so it's easy for us modern people to read this and go, this sounds like something out of a pirate movie. Um, none of us are really going to wait on the side of the road with clubs and go beat people to death uh, and take their things. There might be some of you who have been tempted to join these types of violent gangs, but most of us probably not in this room. Um, and so I want to pull in other ways that, that we might rely on our strength. Um, we might be stronger physically. Um, we might be quicker witted than other people, um, faster at debate, being able to put people in their place, make them feel awkward so that we win the, win the day, uh, win the argument. We might be intellectually superior. We might be physically attractive, have more charisma, so on and so on. Each one of us has been gifted with something that makes us strong. Uh, and the danger there is relying on our own strength. When we rely on our own strength, um, we become self-righteous, and that blinds us to how we really are weak and not ultimately strong. I want to read a quote that I actually added in this morning um, from C.S. Lewis. Um, I apologize, I don't exactly know where it's from, but it's from C.S. Lewis, so you can look up the context. But um, He says, remember, as I said, the right direction leads only to peace. Wait, leads not only to peace, but to knowledge. When a man is getting better, he understands more and more clearly the evil that is still left in him. When a man is getting worse, he understands his own badness less and less. A moderately bad man knows that he's not very good. A thoroughly bad man thinks he's all right. This is common sense, proverbial wisdom. Really, you understand sleep when you're awake, not when you're sleeping. And so the warning there is to not be blind to our own strengths and then use that to take advantage of others, to plunder them, to destroy them. Really, to put them in the pit was to cancel them, to make them no more. And so... That's what they were really attempting to do there. Sinners, uh, the Hebrew handling of this word sinners, because we can look at it and go, who, who are the sinners? We're all sinners, but in this text, he's referring to hardened people. And so just like Lewis had just told us, hardened people are no longer attempting to be good, but now they're teaming up and they're recruiting others to be with them and to join with them in their bad behaviors. So that first warning is don't rely on your own strength and be like the hardened sinners who rely on their own strength to take advantage of others. The second enticement that we come to is the enticing hope of identity. So the verses that we have here are 14 and 15 and 16. They say, throw in your lot among us. We will, have, we will all have one purse to come join us, come be part of our tribe. 
And he says, my son, do not walk in the way with them. Hold back your foot from their paths, for their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed blood. The call right now in our culture is to make an identity for yourself, choose one, pick a team, and then defend that. And there's a danger that we need to be aware of that's floating around us right now. So when we find a group of people who help us to justify ourselves, our self-wisdom, we can be tempted to put our hope in that identity um, or that tribe, that stronghold. And if we find ourselves in a group whose ultimate value is the identity of that group in that man-made wisdom, um, that can create a tendency for us to want to strongly defend that. And sometimes that does include violence. And I think we, we see that in our world today. So the application on, on this one is to not be enticed of an identity or to throw your lot in with those who are calling you to join our tribe, come defend it, even if it takes violence. So what are you tempted? What are you tempted by of an identity? It could be religious. Um, it could be starting out good, but when it becomes ultimate, it can carry us away with it. Um, anything that is from a source other than what the identity God has given you um, is a dangerous one. So that's the second warning. I forgot to set my timer. I have no idea. <laughs> Dave makes this look easy. Um, so the third false hope that I want you to see um, is the enticing hope of escaping judgment. So we see here verses 17 um, through 19. For in vain is a net spread in the sight of any bird, but these men lie in wait for their own blood. They set an ambush for their own lives. Such are the ways of everyone who is greedy for unjust gain. It takes away the life of its possessors. So it's interesting. He uses this illustration of a bird. Um, Dave talked about how the Hebrew really pulls out the word simple um, a lot throughout Proverbs, um, where you have the simple person, the simple-minded, don't be a fool or a foolish person. The father uses this illustration of a simple animal, a bird brain, really. Um, no offense to birds, I love them. But you get the, the saying there. Even a bird knows that if there's a trap spread for it, not to land there. Um, and so you can't trap a bird by having a trap that's obvious. That's what he's saying there. But then he's saying, these people aren't even as smart as a bird. They don't even see the trap that they're lying for themselves um, by doing these things. But the enticement here, I think, is that they think they're getting away with it. Until they're trapped, until the judgment for the foolishness comes to them, they think they're getting away with it. And so the warning here is against thinking our decisions won't catch up to us. Um, the enticement is that we will escape judgment by becoming the judge. And so if we judge good and evil, as we saw Satan telling Eve that she could do, then we think we're escaping judgment. Sin always wants justification. It must have it, and it will have it. Self-justification will end in death. So that leaves us kind of in a bad place. But there was one who came, and he lived perfectly, and he died for us. All of us who put our, our trust in him, he satisfied that judgment. And so we have this grace that gives us a way out of this cycle that started with Adam and Eve of not trusting God and trusting ourselves. He deserved the greatest garland. He deserved the greatest honor, but he was given a crown of thorns. So each of these false hopes 
they could also be seen as, as strongholds. Um, a stronghold, you might think of a, an old city. They used to build up um, walls, and that was their way to protect against intruders. So the outside world, the wilderness, was a very dangerous place, and so they built walls to make strongholds, and that's what they put their hope in. And so we build strongholds of our strength, of our identity, or of our ability to escape judgment, and we think that they're going to give us peace and comfort and security, but these are all false hopes. They fail regularly, and I think we all know that. I mean, we all have had our strength fail. Um, I know the older I get, the more my strength fails, the more things don't work properly. Um, we've all had a people group or a tribe let us down, um, disappoint us and fail us. Um, some of you have had churches that have let you down and failed you. Um, those fail. And judgment will find us. We know that from our lives lived, that judgment does find us. It's a scary place to be out there in the wilderness, um, depending on weak strongholds. So in this, in this text, we've had a father that is warning about some of the enticements that his son will encounter in the world. And we live in an age where there are enticements everywhere, um, everywhere we look, every screen we look at. And um, I was, these numbers were really sobering when I looked them up. Um, I hope they are to you, too. The average American spends 17.5 hours a week on social media and 21 hours a week watching TV. It's higher in younger people than that. Um, our church services here at Grace are usually about an hour and a half a week. And so that made me really think about it. Um, where am I looking for wisdom? Where, what am I listening to? Like, do, are we Googling spiritual advice? Are we looking to our tribes on social media to give us security and strength, um, comfort and peace? And I just want to encourage us that God's wisdom is the only place we'll truly find peace. And we can take assurance that it's been that way forever. Every generation, we're not greater because we live in a modern time. Um, that's a chronological snobbery, as I think Lewis used to say. Um, so we're not, we're not really any smarter. We've, we've not changed any. So take heart in that. So with all these sources of information and wisdom, uh, that can be overwhelming. It can be anxiety driven, and I think we see that. We live in what's called the age of anxiety, um, when there's so many choices. I mean, you can even feel that going to shop for toothpaste at the grocery store. It's like, I, I don't know which one to choose. We had a friend uh, visit from another country once, and they were like, why do y'all have so much stuff? If you need deodorant, you should just go get it and not have to have a whole aisle of it to choose from. Um, but seriously, the choices for wisdom the choices for security, the choices for identity are almost endless in the world that we live in. It's noisy and it's, it creates anxiety. I know at times I struggle with anxiety um, and I need to be rooted back uh, to something outside of myself and outside of the world that's not spinning constantly. Um, so I want to kind of take us back to that, that imagery of that ship floating around with the light on the bow, thinking that it's going somewhere when it's set adrift. Whenever we have a North Star, when we have God's wisdom to look to, when we have God to pray to, when we have something greater and higher, we can become a non-anxious presence on the boat, if you were. Um, we cannot have fear in the midst of chaos. I think if we look at the Gospels, we see Jesus on the boat, not having fear. We can be like him. 
that takes the redemptive work of Christ in us to work on us um, through his word, through his spirit, we can have peace. And whenever we, we are that non-anxious presence on the boat, we can show others, we can tell them, hey, look up. Look up, there's something that's not moving. It hasn't moved since the beginning of time. It's there, it's bigger than, than what we have here. This leads us to, to peace in Christ. And so Jim, I, I went probably pretty fast, but if you're ready, uh, Jim's going to come up and lead us through communion. Um, and communion is really a, a great time to think about what we're putting our hope in, where our wisdom is falling, where it's lying, and what we're trusting in. So, Jim. Hi, thanks, Jonathan. Yeah. Thanks for sharing your word. So as believers in Christ, uh, people have been sharing in communion for thousands of years, over 2,000 years now. And this is an opportunity for us to, to remember, first of all, we have a new identity in Christ. We are something different than we were before we trusted in Christ. And we celebrate that new identity. We celebrate that Jesus gave us that opportunity. Uh, we also want to remember Clearly, how did that happen? It happened through Christ, the only perfect man, the only one perfect in wisdom, to come and give himself for us, to give his body and his blood so that we could have this new identity. And then it's also an opportunity for us to rededicate our lives, uh, to remember that we're still not who we would like to be. We're still not perfect. We won't be in this life. But we do want to strive to be more like Christ because he has given us this new identity. He is in us and with us all the time, spurring us on to greater acts of love towards other people and towards others who don't know Christ. And so uh, the way that we do that here is we, we stand, we rotate counterclockwise, or clockwise, and we uh, come out to the left and come around and take the elements. Now. If you're not following Christ, if you are not trusting in him, or you're in, uh, in rebellion to his authority in your life, then we'd ask you to not take the elements, but just to pass by and just to ask yourself, what is it that I'm trusting in now? What is it that's guiding me in my life? What is the North Star that I'm saying, hey, if I just had that, I could be what I want to be. Uh, as you do that, uh, just remember these things. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread and bo broke it and gave thanks. He said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and he blessed it. And he said, this is my blood of the new covenant. Do this in remembrance of me. As long as you eat this bread and drink this cup. We proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Amen. And so you can stand and move out to your left and come on.
back on. There we are. Yeah. So I want, I want to uh, say that if anybody needs prayer, um, we'll have some people over in this area after the service. Um, if you need any prayer at all, um, if you're struggling to find wisdom uh, or needing a friend or anything, uh, just come up and we'll be happy to pray with you. I want to leave you with a benediction from Philippians 4, 4 through 7. Rejoice in the Lord always. Excuse me. <clears throat> Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness, reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. May they be dismissed. Thanks.